everybody, and thank you for joining Dragon Con's alternate and historical fiction track. We are proud to present our virtual panel, Victorian Death Customs, and we want to thank all of our attendees as well as our panelists. So you all enjoy. Well, let's get started with letting our wonderful panelists introduce themselves, starting with Rudy. Oh, yeah. Thanks so much, Gail. Um, my name is Rudy Turner. Um, I work for the Historic Oakland Cemetery. I actually work for a conservancy group called the Historic Oakland Foundation that undergoes the preservation, restoration, storytelling, all the good stuff of uh, restoring a rural Victorian garden cemetery that is actually only a few miles away from Dragon Con, uh, just right downtown from uh, Atlanta. So a uh, death enthusiast, uh, and I'm actually a private event coordinator there. So I help plan all manner of parties in the cemetery. So interesting job. Liana? Hello, I am Liana Renee Heber, and I am an author of 13, uh, going on 14 and a couple more, uh, gothic gas lamp fantasy novels. So those are fantasy novels that are set in a gas lit 19th century, late 19th century with a cast of diverse characters who are coming together to save the day. Uh, my most recent series is the Spectral City series, which deals with a group of psychic women who work with the dead to solve crimes. So very much incorporating some of what we'll be talking about today in terms of spiritualism and interest in contact with the dead and uh, how that translates into Eve's work. And she dresses in mourning for her job every day in respect for the dead. So uh, I, as a goth, uh, do the same. <laughs> Beth? Hi, I'm Beth Dolgner. I write paranormal fiction and nonfiction. Uh, my new series actually features a Victorian home and cemetery. Uh, and I actually got into Victorian death and mourning customs while I was volunteering at Oakland Cemetery where Rudy works. Um, I was there for about 10 years and just got really interested in all of the death customs. And uh, actually I'm at the point now where I'm able to give presentations on it and uh, talk about not just death and mourning but also spiritualism, which is another one of my favorite subjects. And I'm Gail Z. Martin and Morgan Bryce. As Gail, I write epic fantasy, urban fantasy, steampunk, and more. As Morgan Bryce, I write urban fantasy, male, male, paranormal romance. But there are always ghosts and cemeteries and all kinds of things like that. Many of my characters are psychics and mediums, so it's all right there. Well, let's start with the whole idea of why we talk about Victorian death customs. Uh, they, they really raised death and dying and mourning to a high art and a bit of an industrial complex. Um, and of course, these folks lived through all kinds of, of fevers and plagues, the Civil War, uh, high mortality rate in childbirth, high uh, infant and child mortality. Uh, they were very familiar with death. So when we talk about death at home, what are we really talking about from a Victorian standpoint to understand a little more how all this other stuff came to be. Beth? Well, I, I mean, I, I think that for the Victorians, I, I always say they had one of two choices. They could either be utterly terrified of death or they could embrace it because it was such a prominent part of their lives. And I don't, I don't know that we can ever really understand how looming of a figure death was in their daily life and so it makes sense that they would have just built it up into this kind of almost a morbid celebration with all of the the rituals and the superstitions and the uh just the the rules that you had to play by when somebody died and so I think it it, it really is an interesting reflection of of that time period okay Liana I think that one finds comfort in ritual and the Victorians were expert at rituals of all kinds. And so um, death did happen in the home. It was something where you would have a wake in the house. And it was really only, you know, po folks would come in and you would, you would drape uh, black fabric over surfaces. There were superstitions, you would cover mirrors so the spirits wouldn't get trapped. There are all of these ways in which you would transform your home into a funeral parlor. Um, and your parlor would become the place where the wake would happen. And it's only the 20th century when we started as a culture outsourcing death that we renamed uh, the parlor into the living room to differentiate it as a place where no one was ever dead that lived there. And when it's when when we talk about those, those changes in language, when I've, when I've said these things on a panel, folks just go, oh, 
you know, because it's just those those changes of language that we just completely take for granted. And so for for the Victorians, the, it being so much a part of their lives, they grieved much more organically. I think in some ways there's been, uh, especially with the um, um, with a more positive death movement, uh, with the Order of the Good Death coming into the scene, a much more uh, a much better understanding that that ritual and being kind of a part of this whole process rather than outsourcing it maybe is healthier for us as a grieving process. So, you know, that's that's up for discussion, but uh, I, I'm looking forward to hearing what Rudy has to say about all of this. Um, well, thank you. Um, I agree with all of those things. Uh, and I talk about this a lot when I give tours of the cemetery and something I'm always trying to kind of put in like a broader context and the way I always think about it and explain it, uh, especially to like young school groups, is one, um, it's a socioeconomic thing. You had an emerging middle class in the Victorian era, and you had a significant amount of people suddenly living in urban areas. Like, I think it's something like, you know, there was not a city, the only two populous cities in England at the beginning of Victoria's reign in, is it 1837, was like, there was two and by the end there's like 37 where there's a grand greater population so you have people no longer living from you know cradle to grave with their families on family farms you have the industrial revolution you have people suddenly um kind of in this whole different society and they also too uh, aren't as necessarily focused on um just day-to-day -day living with that middle class, with all of these kind of conveniences that emerge, um, people kind of had the time to start to adopt, uh, even people who maybe didn't have access to it before, um, these society culture kind of things, these, and also too, that like keeping up with the Joneses of what are your neighbors doing? How are they behaving? And I think that informs a lot of the like customs of the time. Um, and I agree with you guys, like just the nature of life, the expectancy is so uh, short. Um, it just, it, it was something that had to be dealt with. There was a large number of people dying and you couldn't just put them in a, in your yard, in your, on your family's farm or in the church graveyard or even in the floor of the church anymore. You had to completely think about doing it differently. Yeah, and, and I, I go back to how intimate and, and familiar Victorians were with death because right now we, we tend to think everybody, every, of course everybody lives to be you know 75, 85, and it's odd and unusual if somebody dies younger than that, but they were used to losing you know so many children before they got to age five, losing mothers in childbirth, no antibiotics. So if you got a cut that went bad, didn't matter how old you were, you died. Um, and then, then there was the war. So people lost so many family members and friends all the time that they had to come up with something, like Liana said, to, to make sense of it, to, to bring some sort of control, to um, to feel like they were honoring the dead, because this was if not an everyday occurrence, not a rare one by any means. So uh, yeah, and you could even get embalmed in the parlor at home. Yeah, so. I mm -hmm. think consumerism also too, but I think plays a part because you start to have commercial goods and magazines and all of these things where people are like, have extra money to spend on all of this stuff. And I think we'll see later, like all of the little tiny details that go along with it. Uh, to kind of decorate the death, so to speak. Not to mention funeral biscuits, which were important. Uh, absolutely. Well, and like you said, the, the idea of keeping up with the Joneses, the, mm -hmm. when you look at the garden style cemeteries of the 19th century, which were, you know, an invention of the 19th century to try to, again, be, have a place that was basically a public park. It was very active. Folks would go and have, you know, picnics with their loved ones, their deceased loved ones, you know, and, and it wasn't a morbid thing. It was a celebration actually. And then because of this emergent middle-class, the thing with the nouveau riche, sort of the new, re the new rich, 
is that they want it to be performative and have lavish displays. So a lot of times that emergent middle class had the fanciest tombstones, the biggest mm -hmm. mausoleums, because they were sort of trying to show off some of that wealth. Whereas some of the older money might actually be a little more understated in their monuments and things like that. So it's a very interesting thing where uh, definitely, as already saying about consumerism and that the idea of culture of, of, of things commemorative things. Uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll go further into that as we go, but it's, it's such a, it gave us beautiful things that we still appreciate today in these garden style cemeteries. Um, and as someone who gives tours of Central Park, uh, when Central Park was created in the 1850s, Frederick Law Olmsted, the designer said specifically, he did not want to have statuaries in his park because he did not want it to be like a graveyard. He was referencing Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn and, and um, uh, uh, Greenwood in Brooklyn and um, the and Mount the, Auburn maybe the, 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 there's the Woodlawn in the Bronx Wood, the, Woodlawn the, yeah, sorry Garden, uh, yes absolutely and those you know he didn't want the Central Park to be confused with the garden style cemetery movement he was overruled by the board of directors who they were rich people who wanted statues in the park so they won out but I think that's a very it's a very interesting thing that we uh, can can use as this juxtaposition of the 19th century because it really was the garden style cemetery that got interest in the public's park movement public parks movement and then Central Park took that in a whole nother direction that was you know landscape architecture was born out of this so I really do think if it wasn't for the garden style cemetery we wouldn't have the public parks movement. Well, and, and that's a perfect segue to talk about what we mean by this garden style cemetery and why it was so different because before that, people got buried in churchyards or as Rudy mentioned, if you lived on a family farm, there was that pretty tree out on the hill yonder and you could, that's where everybody went. And now with people moving into cities, more density, you can't just put somebody in your backyard. So uh, Beth, Tell us what we're, what does it mean, garden style cemetery? How, what, what are we talking about here? Uh, it truly is a garden. And, and these garden cemeteries were some of the first that were not related to a church. Like you said, they weren't churchyards anymore uh, that were within the communities. They were purposely uh, pieces of land away from the city, away from the living, where people would go not only to bury their dead, but also just to enjoy getting out of the city for a little while. You know, you would go there, as Liana said, you would have picnics, you would garden uh, on top of your loved one's graves, you would visit with your neighbors who were there tending to the graves of their loved ones. And, you know, we already talked about, this was a time of the industrial revolution. A lot of cities were not nice places to be. And so the idea of getting out into the country and enjoying the flowers and the trees and the fresh air would have been incredibly nice, despite the fact that it was at a cemetery. Rudy? Um, so I mentioned before, Oakland Cemetery is a, you know, rural Victorian garden style cemetery. We were founded in 1850. And it's really interesting to see that we have this kind of cemetery in Atlanta, because Atlanta was like a very industrial railroad town. But you started to have families and different people kind of moving into that area. It was originally farmland that was way out in the country, uh, but now it's clearly just a part of downtown. The Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, Marta Station is like right there, but the railroad runs behind the cemetery that's been there as long as Oakland has. Um, but something about that too, you speaking to the public park of it all, it was Atlanta's first public park. Um, and another, uh, like, as I mentioned before, people were living differently. So you have these municipal cemeteries, because not only do um, family members need to be buried, but you also have indigent and unknown people who need to be buried. Um, and so you had, you know, potter's fields, which are public spaces where the, the government would essentially undertake, that's a pun, I guess, undertake the, the process of burying these folks. Um, and we, we served that function and it just expanded rapidly, um, to be from six acres to 48 acres. And, um, but it's a beautiful sprawling place with all of this really beautiful individual, um, you know, ornamentation and monuments and people it's, you know, I, you know, in modern parlance, it's like wealth signaling or something, but people really would, um, put everything they had into their mourning sometimes like people paid into um, different organizations in order so that they when they did pass 
they would have the money for the not only the the monuments and the statuary and the land, but also too for the clothing and everything that came along with it. Um, but a lot of families too, that might actually be the only piece of property they owned their family's lot. So Oakland Cemetery is uh, was essentially sold in lots where it would be a space for about twelve burials, like eight to twelve individual standard uh, earth interment. Um, and so, and also another thing about people being buried in the ground was an important part too. Like cremation was not at all in vogue in the West in this time because people thought you needed your entire mortal remains in order to go with you to heaven. Uh, so this idea of, yeah, whole body in the ground, beautiful monument to show that they were loved and their life meant something. Um, and then the lovely byproduct is a beautiful public park. And so when, when people who are watching this think of maybe a cemetery that they visited that has the big trees and the, the big monument, you know, the angels and the little lamb on the tombstone and maybe the flowering bushes, that's a byproduct of this garden cemetery movement. And really, you know, the whole idea of tending the graves on Memorial Day and going and putting some marigolds by the headstones, in rural areas, especially in the South, that's still done. And it, it was done in many other places until just a few, the last few decades. So some of these, some of these things we've gotten from the Victorians have lasted us quite a long time and, and persist into the future. Now, we've, we've mentioned how there was this whole uh, ritual around death and what you were supposed to do. And some of that was helping the, the bereaved and some of that was making money for people who sold you the things to do the things you needed to do. But the clothing, particularly for women, pay, played a big role. Men got off a lot easier. They might have a black headband. If you've watched It's a Wonderful Life, uh, George Bailey has a black armband because his father died and that's his way of showing mourning. But it all really fell to the women to knock themselves out here on showing how bereaved they were. And Liana, you've, you've got your gorgeous outfit and I know Beth, you have some of the jewelry that goes with this. So tell us what this was all about because it's very complicated. Well, it, it was a, a, an elaborate costuming. Now, a lot of folks had, you know, the, the Victorian palette for the average person was fairly somber. So you probably had some black pieces in your wardrobe, but mourning was in full black. If you were a bride uh, who was a, a widow, uh, you would need to be in mourning for a full year. Um, other family members, this varied a little less than that. You wouldn't be uh, seen out in public much if you were. You, you, it was because of some sort of emergency or you're attending some other funeral and you would be seen in all black veiled sometimes very heavily um, and and you would have you would be draped you know head to toe in in black and when you went into partial mourning after that year then you could take on grays or purples or some other muted tones uh, and then you would have maybe still pieces of black so one of the things that you know folks would procure or have in their wardrobe is pieces of black to put on to other black things. So um, it became sort of piecemeal things. So you could have a beautiful collar. Um, and this would be something that a more middle-class person would have. It's just a beautiful kind of neck collar. And then you would attach it over the top of your dress and then pin it with a pin. And then you have, this is a, a, an overlay and then you can remove that. There are morning aprons. Um, and so I'll, I'll be sharing a picture of a morning apron, which you tie around your waist and it has an additional layer of black over top of something else. Um, your gloves could be adorned uh, with beadwork or not. Um, and again, a lot of this depended on the level of class that you were in, how elaborate these things would be. So for a middle class collar, you might not have beadwork, but if you have an upper class collar, a morning collar might be a piece like this, which is all entirely beaded. And then again, this would attach at the back and be pinned around the front. So um, with these pins, this was a, a way of bringing a lot of these pieces together. So jet, jet from around the world. And there's a rivalry of jet because jet is a, a hardened uh, a carbonite uh, stone. It is a black stone. And Whitby jet uh, from Whitby, England 
a la Whitby Castle, a la Dracula. So it has kind of a nice Gothic feel here. This is a Whitby jet beaded necklace from the 19th century here. Um, this was much, this was very sought after jet was from Whitby, England. Um, if you couldn't afford Whitby jet, which was the highest end, there was a resin that was being mined out of um, Indonesia called Gutta Persia. And so that um, would sometimes be mixed. So here's a cross that is mostly gutta percha with, uh, so again, this is like a hard resin, almost like a, uh, it's a naturally occurring resin so from a tree sap that hardens. And then the beads are Whitby jet beads. So the imagery would be very important in these things very often. Um, in this case, this is another gutta percha piece where the centerpiece is a hand with a daisy. Daisy in the Victorian language of flowers means attachment. So this was the sense of being still attached to the one that you have lost. And the beads on the side are Whitby Jet. Now, Whitby Jet wasn't the only jet, correct, Beth? That's right. I, I live in Germany, so I'm partial to the German jet, which was actually used for jewelry long before the Victorian era. But of course, the, the, the mourning implication became very popular. My piece is actually very similar to your last one. It's this little hand holding flowers. Um, and it also has a little piece of wheat in there. Of course, wheat was a big part of symbolism uh, for death because uh, essentially your soul had been harvested when you died. So you see that a lot in Victorian death motifs. Um, and I think to, to add to what you were saying about the different classes and how you would see differences in what people wore, I think it's interesting that mourning was very much the privilege of the wealthy uh, because you could afford to just sit at home and do nothing but be sad all day long um, or secretly smiling underneath your veil as was probably the case sometimes. Uh, and working class women, they couldn't afford to, to take all of this time off to, to be sad about their husband or their children or whomever might've died. So they might've dyed their, their dress black, but they would have had to get back to work very quickly. So I think it's interesting that the more money you had, the more time you could take to, to sit around and and really feel your grief. Absolutely, and so I think that's such an important uh, thing to think about how the different classes were, uh, were able to react to any of this too and how that factored into the types of materials that you could afford for your pieces. So this is actually uh, kind of a partial mourning piece from the late uh, 1890s, early 1900s. So it's just basically a glass faceted center with marcasite around the edge. And marcasite was a very popular 19th century um, mineral that was faceted to look like a gemstone. So marcasite was very popular for the middle class because they couldn't afford diamonds, but they still have something that's really sparkly. And it really works for partial mourning because it's sort of gray. It's got a gray scale piece. So, and like this marcasite, a uh, very tender, delicate marcasite bow could be pinning those morning collars that I was showing earlier. And then sometimes too, whether it's just a, ge sometimes it would be geometric. So another mixture of Whitby jet and glass, uh, again, much more middle class on this one because it's mostly glass. And then uh, you'd have some heritage that would factor in. Here's one all of fleur de lis. So this is all gutta persia. So this is all that resin uh, from Indonesia. So I have my fleur de lis upside down. Um, so you know, again, sometimes heritage, uh, family lineage would factor into the symbology. You very often will see these things, uh, some of this symbology that we're showing here in terms of the flowers and, and as Beth mentioned, the wheat, as I was mentioning, that daisy held in those hands, uh, that imagery would also then find its way onto headstones as well. I was going to add that. I'm like, with the Victorians, everything meant something, especially with flora and fauna and all of these different symbols and even to taking um, symbols kind of from like antiquity because that was the time of exploration where they were going out and doing these big archaeological studies and suddenly you kind of saw all of this like neoclassical Greek Roman Egyptian uh, art coming into to play with that um, and I, I wanted to add one thing because we're talking about Victorians and we're talking about Victorian mourning. I feel like you have to throw in there that it all started with Victoria herself. She was like the it girl. So she wore white on our wedding. People still wear white at their weddings these days. She mourned her husband, Albert, for the last 40 years of her life. She carried a picture around with him. She wore, you know, Don the Black. Uh, she had them set up his chamber pot every day, just as usual. 
Uh, and I think that people really were kind of like fascinated by that. And it was like, almost like celebrity culture to kind of try to mimic that in your own life. There, there was oh, a Monty, there's a Monty Python sketch about uh, where my, uh, Michael Palin plays Queen Victoria carrying around, dragging Albert's coffin behind her. And I think, you know, that was a joke, but it was sort of, you know, kind of a, uh, poking fun at just how, um, you know, lavish she really took mourning to a whole nother level. Uh, and, and I think um, that, you know, but she really did legitimately love him. So it wasn't that it was coming from a performative place necessarily. It just became so much of it. It had such a ripple effect really. Well, and you know, when, when I first read Gone with the Wind and, and there's that whole scene where Scarlett O'Hara, who's 16 and newly widowed because her husband's been killed in the war, goes to the dance and everyone is scandalized. And I, you know, at the time I didn't know anything about this stuff. And I thought, well, he's dead, well, she's 16, what do you want? And now when you realize what a slap in the face to propriety it was for her to show up at a time of heavy mourning in clothing that was not mourning appropriate at a dance and then dance with another man. I mean, this was like, wearing an offensive t-shirt and throwing everybody the bird and and you know uh that was a big deal but the other thing was and and beth and leonie you both brought this up about the the class and the money piece if you were wealthy you could afford to have clothing you only wore when somebody died if you were poor you might have one good dress so you'd have to dye it to be able to not look like you weren't you know uh properly mourning but then there and and there were fabrics that were less expensive but there was a dark side to that too in that the dye was poisonous and the fabrics were highly flammable so there's sort of this morbid little thing of um getting more business <laughs> yeah the crate of it all is seems just dismal the amount of crepe everyone was wearing and decorating with and it would give you like terrible reaction on your skin and your face from wearing the veil like the signs of mourning went with you wherever you went because <laughs> also dyeing your clothes was not very easy either no no and I did want to come back to the symbolism in the cemeteries because that's where we get like the angels and all of that. Can you say a little more about how do we translate those symbols when we visit a cemetery now to know what we're looking at or what they were trying to say? Well, my best suggestion is to go find a tour guide because sometimes you'll be surprised <laughs> by it. Um, I learn new things all the time, but you know, most of it and in general, what we're talking about too are like, judeo-christian western uh like traditions of like white people um african americans had their own kind of system and when we talk we'll talk a little bit later i'll bring in some differences there but the symbolism in general because again it's all about saying when someone dies um their worth their value your mourning is saying that their life was worth something and they have something to say about everything so that um your headstone can say not only the day you died and the, you know, the day you were born, the day you died, sometimes how you died, not as often, um, you know, a quote or something, but that symbolism could say, if you were rich, if you were poor, if you died young, if you died of a lot, you had a long life, if you were a religious person, all of these things, and they're kind of more subtle. Um, one of the most common kind of things is actually that cemetery of it all which is based on the like greek uh and it's bringing the connotation of to slumber that eternal sleep you see a sleep in jesus that's a really common epitaph um so with funeral monuments you typically are going to have the person's name the dates as i mentioned and a, a quote be it uh you know um like I said, I sleep with Jesus, a biblical quote, different things. And then you had the symbolism. So you would have, if you wanted to, uh, to show wealth, it could be that you have tassels because it was expensive to have tassels in your home. And so it's another way to signal that you had wealth and status. Um, also too, there's a lot of symbolism that references 
um, essentially that eternal slumber. People really wanted to take kind of solace in the fact that their family is now, um, you know, it's an eternal sleep. It's a peaceful thing. And then their ascension to heaven. So you see a lot of female statuary that took the place of the like puritanical skulls and crossbones and kind of more death forward imagery that you saw, like, especially in medieval times um, where certain start, they were replaced by cherubs and angels. Um, and you have um, things like the, uh, I would say, so daisies, another, like you said, daisies were um, a really popular symbol. And one of them is uh, it, it, daisies can grow anywhere. So that resilience is shown through daisies. Um, they're flowers. They convey all of these different things. It's beauty, the beauty of the soul, uh, the cycle of life and death because of a flower's, you know, kind of fave mortality. Um, and then you have things, lambs are really common, um, symbolism. You see them a lot of times for young people, for children. Like you mentioned, I think it's like only, there was like 25% of children didn't make it to the age of five in the era. So you see tons of these lambs and the lambs represent two things. They represent, uh, you know, the Christ sacrifice, uh, you know, uh, for humanity. Um, and so that also too, then comes back to children and their innocence. Um, and, and willows. Sorry, go ahead. Oh no, that's okay. I wanted to make sure you touched on uh, the African American side of things uh, yeah. because that's very different. Yeah. So um, I something I think is really interesting and cool about this conversation, and something I've learned more through working at Oakland Cemetery. Um, our six, or our, excuse me, our sexton, who is the uh, person who oversees everything there at the cemetery, he's been there for a long time. But he's also worked in the funerary business for a long time, and he works at an African-American funeral home. And I, living in Atlanta, which is a predominantly Black city and has been uh, essentially since the, uh, you know, ter after the civil end of the Civil War, um, but you still, even though people, like, you people didn't find equality even in death, so um, black people essentially had when enslaved people. So it's at like Oakland, um, the, the city commission essentially had to force people to bury black people there in the cemetery. And when they were buried there, they did not receive the same funeral rights. They had to go in the back of the cemetery. If they were, they would have, they wouldn't be able to visit their family members at the same time. And so after emancipation, you saw this emergence of a new, um, business and a new opportunity for uh, African American people to provide funeral services, provide dignity um, for all of these these people, and uh, also to contribute to their community. They took the money that they you know raised and were able to raise their status and give that same respect to those those people. And a lot of the the, the traditions um, were. A similar and then sometimes you would have things that were um you know more in line with the culture they brought when they were um you know brought over to the united states as part of as part of chattel slavery a lot of people come from west africa and you have things like praise houses and ring shouts and all these things that um ways that people would gather and celebrate but all of the i think what the most interesting thing is uh, too, talking about there, that segregation still exists in the funeral industry today, but a lot of these Victorian kind of practices are actually still present in African American funerals. They still, you know, start at the family home. A lot of times the hearses are still horse drawn buggies and carriages. It's very ostentatious. It's very much about celebrating life and feeding everybody and also, too, memorial clothing, I think, is a really fascinating part of it. It's something we've probably all seen is, you know, commemorative T-shirts to say that someone's passed. Um, and that's almost kind of like that mourning garb that you can don as a way to signal to someone that you've lost them. But also, it's a little more celebratory. Uh, so I appreciate you bringing that up. And then um, with African-American burial grounds, you know, they were segregated until the Civil Rights Act. So um, like with Oakland, we have our, what we now call our historically African-American grounds. A lot of amazing 
people in the community, but that area of the cemetery was not well kept. And that's common pretty much with throughout the United States area, like black cemeteries just didn't get the same attention to them and the same resources. Um, and also too, a lot of times because of the resources for the families immediately weren't the same, they, uh, their monuments were wood uh, or shrubs or personal effects, things that didn't really stand the, the element. So, you know, the, the monuments we still have present for those, uh, some, you know, the granite and the, I just forgot what, marble, that's what it's called. Uh, those monuments still stand, but you would look and see, like, at our, in any African-American section of the cemetery, you'd say, doesn't seem like there's very many people here, but there's actually a pretty, probably a large number of folks. Um, but it's because, yeah, that just, those areas didn't get a lot of love. Well, and, and one of the things that then after the deaths and, and after the, the funerals were over, there was carrying forward, you mentioned the memorial clothing, but there was certainly the idea of memento mori for the, the upper classes, and that could be commemorative jewelry, that could be hair jewelry made from the hair of the, the dead person, which sounds creepy to us, but was very common and very elaborate back then. Um, I know... Liana has a an example of that, but oh, show us that and then I uh, and tell us about it, please. So this is from 1882, and what it is is it is sort of a basically a, a a shut locket with a glass oval, and inside is braided hair from the deceased. So you know now. I just, I treasure this because this is something that was treasured. And so I, some people, you know, honestly, when I have showcased this at DragonCon before, some people sort of recoil because it is, it is rem remains, but it's, I think as long as you, the, the owner of this, you know, um, and I knew the provenance of it, this came from an antique shop in Portland, Oregon. Um, I think as long as you, the, the new owner of this respect it, then you're carrying on that tradition of respect. And I also just really think it's beautiful. And, and it also happens to be my hair color, which is kind of unique um, and a little kind of fascinating. And, and just for me, the idea of, of things never really end, they just sort of go on, which was a great comfort for this idea of the memento mori. You know, hair jewelry is really a fascinating thing. It's an art, it's a lost art, but it's there's wonderful examples. So, you know, Google Victorian hair jewelry, you'll see all kinds of things that utilized people's teeth there is a, a very famous thistle molar brooch <laughs> that was utilized, you know? And so I, I feel like there was, was not the kind of, again, that separation we talked about earlier between the dead body being this, you know, terrifying, horrifying thing. There, there was a celebration of uh, some of the things of the human body that would still keep. And so and that for, formulates the basis for some of this. And the Victorians were at the beginning of the photography era. So we also have the phenomenon of death photography. And if you've seen the movie, The Others, um, that plays a role in that movie. Um, Beth, anything to add on, on Victorian death photography? Yeah, uh, I, I think that's one of the reasons the Victorians were so into keeping things like hair work jewelry, because a lot of times you would not have a photo of that person from life. You know, photography at the time was very expensive. Um, and we've already talked about the fact that oftentimes it was children who died. So they would have died before they ever even had the opportunity to have a photo made of them. So getting the chance to photograph someone after they died was usually the only way you would ever have to remember what that person looked like. And that would have been a really valuable keepsake for a family. So I think to us, it, it seems maybe a little bit morbid, but I think it makes a lot of sense in the context of the Victorians and the lives and, that they had. But what I think is interesting is today we seem to be seeing a rise in post-mortem photography again, but it is not the professional, somebody's posed very nicely in their coffin kind of photography they had then. Today, it's people literally taking cell phone pictures. Um, we're seeing more and more of that as people kind of get used to the idea that I loved this person and I want to remember them. And so I'm just gonna snap a quick picture while I'm at their viewing. I think it's also interesting that, you know, the Victorians got really complicated with this and they'd set up a whole, you know, several people sitting on a bench together, but then one of the people was actually dead or that, you know, they'd set these situations up. 
and there are, there are some up and coming um it's kind of fringe now but who knows where they'll set you up for your funeral if you, if you were a big motorcycle enthusiast they'll set you up on your harley for your wake and people can come by and there's joe uh, which is you know a little bit hearkening back to the victorians um rudy anything on on memento mori or death jewelry or death photography to add yes um i first off my first and personal encounter with hair jewelry was uh i don't shock easily uh and i am very comfortable with all of these things but uh we did a uh, some of the patrons that are descendants that are cemetery have some really amazing pieces of hair jewelry and I knew they were bringing them and I was essentially holding this bracelet saying oh, okay I was like which one of these is the hair piece and they're like the one in your hand and I was like because the entire it was like a braided bracelet it was strands of hair that were woven together essentially to be like you know pieces of thread and then braided together and it's a very uh, there is no duplicating what that feel that tactile feel um, and then with the memento mori, with the photography, um, I found it really fascinating. And at first I didn't really understand it. Um, and it, there's so many interesting parts of it uh, too, about kind of, uh, essentially the editing of those photos. Um, and to think about the reality of it too, cause it's like the, the, they had to sit still for sometimes two minutes, your whole family sitting there with your family member who is propped up. Uh, and you're taking that picture um, it was an interesting thing, but especially with infants, there was a couple really interesting things. And I encourage you guys all to look up. I can't remember what it's called, but essentially they'd sometimes have the mothers draped completely in black holding the infant. And it looks very spooky to modern sensibilities. I feel like even then maybe still um, to kind of be able to show this like life in a person. Um, and then the other part of it is because it was like tin type photography. So they'd have to process it there on site, but people would like painstakingly sometimes paint eyes to make it appear as though the person's eyes are open, um, which you again, because it's like this may be the only photograph you have of a person. Um, a good representation of that in media is in the second season of The Alienist. Uh, they come across uh, a series of memento mori of those photographs of with the baby's eyes painted on and uh it was it's an interesting phenomena so the victorians wouldn't have viewed any of that as being particularly you know paranormal or supernatural or even superstitious but there were persistent superstitions that victorians tended to uh observe about uh taking the body out of the house, having the body in the house. Anybody want to share some of those? Liana? Well, I mentioned earlier covering the mirrors so that the spirit wouldn't get trapped in the house. So taking the body out, you would want to have the body going out feet first. Um, you know, the, just certain things about, about trying to manage the confusion of the soul after it's departed. But we see this actually even goes back to ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead uh, material too, because there was a doorway for the spirit to go out, um, uh, you know, when so much of Egyptian life was about planning for death. And so some of these things are kind of ancient uh, traditions that are with us in ways of like, how do you honor the spirit to make sure that it can go where it needs to go and not get trapped. So whether it's covering mirrors, whether it's the way that you take the body out the door, whether it's um, any of the trappings that you might have in a, a coffin itself, because you have the uh, unfortunate concept of some people would get buried alive because when you were really catatonic for a really long time and couldn't necessarily, uh, medicine was lagging behind. There were people who were actually just in a coma. Um, people thought they were dead. So the idea of a bell inside a coffin, things like that, you know, um, you know there, there's so many different traditions that are, are kind of just, you know, almost terrifying to us to think about, but it's, it's not because uh, anything was particularly trying to be morbid, but it was just a reality of, of science, not quite, 
catching up to where we were industrially. Um, and, you know, society was almost moving farther ahead than, than medicine could keep up. Uh, so I think those things are, are fascinating. And, and also, too, a, a thing about the Victorian, photo the death photography that I find the most interesting is, you know, um, I, I heard a death expert say, you always can tell who is the dead body in the picture because they are the most still. Going back to what Rudy was saying about, you know, how the the, the process of having to sit for a while, uh, we as human beings, we breathe, we move. Um, so the the most in focus person in a Victorian uh, photo is probably no no longer alive. Beth, anything to add on superstitions? Um, not so much superstitions. I'm going to have a little more show and tell because this goes back to what Rudy was saying, and I think actually ties into a lot of those super superstitions, um, is the concept that somebody wasn't dead, they were sleeping. Mm -hmm. That is such a Victorian concept that, that you still exist. You, you are still here. You're, you're just, your body is resting right now. Um, and I actually have these cardboard coffin decorations. Um, this is probably my favorite one in, in the collection, and it says... It says schlaf wohl mein Kind, which means sleep well, my child. So it goes back to that idea that you're just sleeping. And I think that mentality um, that you weren't gone, you were just, you were taking a little break, maybe until judgment day, uh, is part of what helped fuel the spiritualist movement in Victorian era to believe that spirits were still hanging around, just waiting for their chance to come, you know, to come back. And so, of course, we see the rise of, of seances and people trying to communicate with their dead loved ones during this time. And I think that all ties into to that view of death as not being something permanent and not being something where you have tra transitioned completely out of this world. And I think, you know, going back to the idea of how the Victorians had symbolism for everything, they would put special wreaths on the house to let people know their the families had a loss, you know, don't bother them. They would hang black crepe uh, maybe from the, the balcony or, or the window to show, again, family is in mourning. And there used to be a phrase calling somebody a crepe hanger, which means the person who brings the mood down, the buzzkill, um, because there was a whole industry of decorating homes with crepe. And so if you were the guy who brought the crepe and hung the crepe, well, it wasn't a, it wasn't a good thing to see you coming. Uh, you know, that, that's an obscure phrase now, but if you, if you watch old movies, you'll hear that, you know, guy's a buzzkill, so somebody calls him a crepe hanger, and that's, that's where it comes from. Um, now, you did mention the spiritualist movement. We don't have a lot of time left, and that's a whole panel on itself, but um, just very briefly, how does all this tie together with that wanting reassurance that the people who are dead are still there? Uh, Rudy, anything to add on that? Because I know these two have... have an entire panel in them from that. I am a big old skeptic, so I am not the right one to ask, but um, I do think it was a really interesting thing. It was this kind of romantic idea of like reaching through the veil uh, to, to speak to someone because you, yeah, they're still very much a part of your life, but you already have accepted that transition of death. Um, I do want to throw in one about the buried alive thing because I hear a lot about that and then let you guys talk about the spiritualism uh, and this speaks to my skeptic nature is that uh so our first direct burial at the cemetery was a doctor Dr. James Nissen and he was afraid of being buried alive because he knew maybe it happened and a way that a lot of people like there's inventions of you know things you could yell into and bells but he would uh, he asked the attending physician to sever his jugular before he was put into the ground which was not uncommon. They would also bury people with guns, knives, poison. So if you woke up and you were down there, you could, you know, make sure it's all taken care of. So uh, fascinating, strange stuff. But yeah, I'll let y'all talk about the spiritualists. It, it was such a comfort. It, it, it arose out of a desire to comfort and a desire for an interest in the unknown. Um, you know, I mentioned science was uh, kind of a wild card. Um, you know, Darwin's origin of species was was throwing everything up in the air about God and, and all kinds of things. And so it was a time of great questioning. And in that great questioning, there was also this sense of needing comfort in the face of these staggering losses. And we see spiritualism really get its, um, really get going after the Civil War 
are uh, because you had bodies that weren't returning home. So one of the things Rudy mentioned earlier was the idea of, you know, the 19th century, people thought that in order to be at peace, your soul at peace, you had to have a whole body, a body that was whole. Well, in the Civil War, you had a lot of limbless corpses. You had a lot of corpses that were left on a battlefield and not recovered. So the idea that you could speak to and, and, and someone could be a medium and reach out to a whole spirit that was separate from the body and that, that the body's condition was immaterial, that was of course a huge comfort for any the, the full scale industrial war that that really was. We see this uh, Britain got its rise in spiritualism after World War One, which was a senseless war where millions of people were dead and nothing really was gained. Um, and also again, unrecovered bodies, bodies that were limbless, melted with gas, all of these horrific things. And so spiritualism, the idea of this kind of sanctified whole spirit, of course you can understand how that would attract folks. And it was, gaining traction in Quaker circles. That was, Quakers were Protestants and uh, they let women speak in church. And so even if you had no mediumistic tendencies and you were a woman and you had something to say, you'd probably wanna try to find spiritualism as an avenue by which you might wanna talk about equal rights. What you might wanna talk about abolition as the Quakers were abolitionists fighting against slavery. They were for the equal treatment and uh, education of women. Uh, and so the spiritualism became directly entwined with the women's rights movement and additional uh, measures towards abolitionism and equality. And so spiritualism, yeah, there was a lot of people taking advantage of, of the grieving and they were doing elaborate stage shows, but those were the famous people that got debunked by people like Harry Houdini. There was a lot of other people that looked like spiritualism, looked at spiritualism like a grief counselor and would take that on much more about like an, an active quiet role. We'll never know their names because they were just acting, they, they weren't putting on an elaborate show about it. Those were the ones that were uh, magicians basically. And so those were the ones that got you know famous from debunking. So there's a healthy, I mean, one should be healthy uh, in terms of skepticism about the spiritualists, but it was also a definite avenue towards uh, equal rights because no other, no other religion was letting women anywhere near the cloth or the clergy, whereas spiritualism taught that ever, anybody could be a conduit to the beyond. And so that was very, very attractive to all kinds of folks. And that is a whole panel on its own. And, and maybe someday we'll have a chance to do that. But right now we're at the end of our hour. It's gone so fast. So in, in, in a lightning round here, uh, please tell everybody quickly where they can find you online. And if you have a new book or something coming out, uh, please tell us about that. Starting with Beth, please. Uh, yes, I have a book that just came out at the beginning of the month that is uh, called Sweet Dreams. It's the first book in the new Eternal Rest Bed and Breakfast Cozy Mystery Series. Um, it involves, um, like I said, Victorian house, Victorian cemetery, ghosts, a lot of the things that we talked about tonight. And you can find me online at bethdolgner.com. Great. Liana? Liana Renehuber.com, my latest Spectral City series deals with everything we've talked about. Um, and I'm also doing a time slip, multiple timeline series called Time Immemorial, exclusively via Scribed, when I'm also narrating the audiobooks. So you get to hear me be a lady living in four timelines at the same time. <laughs> and Rudy. Well, I will uh, just plug Oakland Cemetery. Uh, all of you guys visiting for uh, Atlanta for Dragon Con or residents, of the metro area, it's beautiful, 48 acres, go walk around, take a tour. Um, Sunday in the Park uh, is our Victorian celebration. There's cosplay, there's all kinds of fun stuff, and this year we're actually going to have uh, the Whalers as well as Jupiter Coyote play. Um, as it's a mix of our Tunes from the Tomb series we had to cancel. So, um, but yeah, just go and, or even if not, go to a cemetery and look at everything, read the headstones, all that stuff, and don't worry about me personally. <laughs> um, I'm really easy to find at klzmartin.com or morganprice.com. Social media is a variation of all those names. I uh, will have a new novel in the Treasure Trail series for my Morgan Bryce name, Blink, which is set in Cape May. Ghosts galore in that one. And a new one in the Deadly Curiosities series, which is under the Gale name. And that's uh, set in Charleston, South Carolina. And we've got pirate ghosts and and uh, even more. So thank you so much to our wonderful panelists for everything that you brought to this. And thank all of you for watching and listening. And uh, there'll be more Dragon Con stuff. So stay tuned.